Hi friends, Ben here from the Center for Crisis and Risk Communications. If you have ever studied crisis and risk communications in a university or college setting, chances are you've used a Dr. Timothy Coombs textbook. Now, not only is Dr. Timothy Coombs arguably one of the world leading researchers, professors, academics, lecturers, teachers, coaches, but he's a dear friend and a senior advisor to our center. We invite you to join us and Dr. Coombs and Dr. Vincent Cavell and Bob Jensen and Rebecca Boltzma and Mayor Jody Gonduck and Associate Vice President Nick Manning from the University of Waterloo and more at Crisis Compass, a crisis communication symposium coming to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, October 24, 25, 2024. Now here's just a few examples of our good friend, Dr. Timothy Coombs. There are a lot of different types of crises you might face, and so it's, it's going to be different, particularly coming out of the work of, of, of Mitroff. Mitroff's work is, is just great from a crisis management perspective, but then how do you bring that to life through communication? My goal was to, to link the two together theoretically in a way that actually mattered for the profession. So attribution theory says when things happen, particularly when bad things happen, you want reasons why they happen you're gonna hold someone responsible for it. And it could be the person who did the action or it could be external circumstances for it. Different crisis types create different perceptions among most people, like, like not all, I mean, some people, it can vary, but we're looking at kind of an average here. What became the most basic response is what we call the ethical base response. And that's where you try and you tell them physically what they need to do to protect themselves from a crisis, it could be a recall, evacuate an area, or anything. That. And you try and help them to cope psychologically. And that means, you know, expressing concern for them. It's the empathy drives that part of it. And that would also include any corrective actions. What are you doing to prevent a repeat of the crisis? Because that's what people want to know. If they've been poisoned by your product, they want to know it's not going to happen again because they don't want that. And when Boeing was having trouble with their planes, their new planes, people wanted to know, is that plane safe to fly? had an engine problem and was stuck at sea. It, it was a very bad situation. It was a crisis because it disrupted their operations. It focused attention on Carnival and there are a lot of very angry customers. Well, of course, I'm gonna reimburse you for <laughs> that trip and I'm gonna cover any cost because they had to come to a different port and I'm gonna make sure that you get home. But there were things they did on top of that. I offered them additional compensation. On, on top of that. So if, if someone just wants to sell you their kind of standard plan, that's not very good. You, you need someone who can come and say, okay, well, let's work together. What type of plan do you need? Because you, we, you've got to understand, because one size doesn't fit all, all. I see really a crisis communication plan is doing two things. One, it's, it can be a reminder. These are things we, we need to remember to do. And it might be things we need to do because uh, we have some policies and procedures in place or these are sort of legal requirements and it'd be really good to remember to do these various things along the way because you, you know you're under you know these high high emotion high stressful high pressure situations when a crisis there's this information vacuum like you know oh the facility exploded but there's so much more you need to know like well where was the explosion what was it what caused it who who was injured and all all sorts of things yeah ai uh is we, we use AI a lot, actually, daily. If you've got a smartphone, you probably use AI anytime. Or uh, let's say you're at home and you use Alexa or you use Google Home, you're using AI. And AI is, is really kind of any sort of uh, computer action that can mimic what humans do. But you, you want those messages pre-prepared and pre-approved ahead of time. And it should be information that will be useful to people or some kind of indicator that you've started taking your actions. But you, you give them as much information as you can, as quickly as you can. Although you're always going to be criticized for being slow. I, I've never seen any post-crisis critique where they said, wow, the company was so fast. They were quicker than we ever thought they could be. Because you know, uh, it, it's just natural. As a crisis manager, you're always working with limited information and you need to respond, but you have to have a measured response because risk tells you what can happen to you. And that becomes your foundation for developing any type of crisis management plan or crisis communication plan. Cause you're like, these are the risks we're likely to face. 
where do airlines put a lot of their time and effort in crisis? It's with plane crashes. That's actually the least likely of any of their crises to occur, but it has the highest impact. That's why when you, when you talk about crisis, you don't just talk about risk. You don't just talk about likelihood, but you talk about impact. And now also they like to talk about velocity, how fast something will happen. So it's like, well, all right, th- if it's slow moving, that gives me more time. So a more important crisis, one with a fat, high velocity, one that's gonna you know, get on me really quickly.